was assigned to work as full-time chaplain with this apostolate in 2006. The apostolate is the lay apostolate of Jesus Christ, the returning King, and it's promoted by the organisation Direction for Our Times. Anne is the earthly founder, we could say, of this apostolate, and she began hearing from the Lord at a very early age in her 20s. These experiences, mystical experiences she had, began to um, increase and become more and more uh, when it eventually culminated in the Lord asking her to uh, write down what he was saying to her and bring them to her bishop and ask his permission to print them. And so it began way back in about 2003 and we have seen many people converted back to the faith, people who have become Christians who weren't previously Christians. And uh, so it has been a great blessing and a great gift to the world. And Anne's experiences are very much consistent with the mystical tradition of the church. She describes her uh, experiences of heaven, her experiences of purgatory, and uh, all the other things that the Lord has said to her. Also, of course, Our Lady, many of the saints, God the Father. So it's a great gift, it's a great blessing. So many people receive the blessings immediately. Many others receive them at a later time and the Lord blesses them over time. I work with a team who served in an organization called Direction for Our Times. And we are a movement which has been born into the Catholic Church. We serve renewal in the Catholic Church. The movement is called the Lay Apostolate of Jesus Christ, the Returning King. Um, so you have the first coming where the Lord came as a baby in the manger, the second coming uh, where the Lord comes and returns as King. In this transition period, the Lord is returning through different souls one at a time. Now this is beautiful because it, it hinges on everyone's individual relationship with Jesus. We receive the Lord's love into our souls, and this makes us holy and happy and beautiful. And then that love flows out into the world. It's very simple. Jesus' plans always first include the well-being of the individual, each one of us. He loves us individually and perfectly and unconditionally. Part of my prayer life includes experiences that most people don't have in prayer. Some of them are interior locutions, which is a voice that I would hear in my soul. And then there are other experiences that I have, experiences the Lord allowed for me and for all of us. And those are experiences of purgatory. During one prayer, I was deeply in prayer with Jesus, and he drew me into him and brought me to a place that was so beautiful. And when I got there, when I opened my eyes, I could see a park-like area. And it was so lovely that I thought it was heaven. And the most compelling experience of it was the experience of deep peace. And so my instinct was to go towards what I thought were children playing. And I thought they were siblings, brothers and sisters, because they were so close to each other. There was such an easiness and a friendliness and love between them. But then I understood everything in this area was so pure and beautiful. So there's a serenity, a peace, and you want to just engage in that right away. But the Lord drew my eyes over to a barrier, a boundary, towards the left, and it was mist. I walked towards it. This was where I was being drawn, and it got more dense as you went into it. And I saw a man sitting on the ground with his back against the tree, and he had his head in his hands. He was suffering terribly from remorse, and his anguish was very great. And I understood that he had, during his life, worshipped a false god, and that was the god of materialism. And because he was so involved with uh, material things, yeah, the acquisition of them, and it meant too much to him. 
he had failed in the area that is most important for us, and that is love. So the people who oh. were entitled to his love didn't receive it, and this created for him terrible remorse and anguish. Help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. Jesus, why is this man in such anguish? Help me! Why is he in such pain? Help me. Please grant him your mercy. Grant him your love and compassion. So I prayed and I watched him. After a period of time, his remorse and his anguish began to lift. And he uh, looked up then and he felt praise for God and he was relieved of this, which gave me great joy. And I understood then that we were in purgatory. The Lord brought me into the mist and we were walking through it for his purposes and so that I could see what he wanted me to see, to share with people. The people suffering in purgatory didn't know we were there. They didn't have benefit of seeing us. Now, when you would begin to pray for someone, then they would feel a consolation. And I would say to people on earth, we, we can't forget in a reasonable manner to pray for our family members who have gone before us, because if they're suffering and we pray, our intercession moves them through that process more quickly. That's my understanding. So that, how important would that be if you were in purgatory? Very important. As I was drawn more deeply into the mist, I encountered other people, one of oh whom God, oh was a woman, God. and she was oh in God, Jesus, d d desperate remorse, really. And she was rocking to console herself, and she was saying, repeatedly, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And it was like a deep frown kind of sorry. There was no, she wasn't getting any satisfaction or any relief in it. I prayed very much for her. Please forgive me all my sins, please. Please, what have I done? Please God, please forgive me. Please God, please forgive me all my sins. Please God, please forgive me God. What have I done? What have I done? And suddenly she stopped rocking and she stopped saying, I'm sorry. And she said, I love you, Jesus. I praise you. I love you, Jesus. I'm so sorry for the mistakes and the impact. Lord, please help the people who were hurt by the mistakes that I made and the things that I did wrong. She, uh, during her life, I understood, was a fortune teller. I didn't know anything about the specifics of that. And it was immaterial and irrelevant. The concern was her anguish at this, you know, uh, the way that she misled people. And people suffered because they were misled by her actions and the things that she did. So it was so joyful to see her then uh, relieved of this and praising the Lord and, you know, receiving love. It's important to note what I understood about purgatory is in a sense, they are so much better off there than we are here because they know God exists. They know they are loved. There's no questions about that. That's beautiful. At the same time, you have that big truth of God's love, and then you have your response to it on earth during your life. And that has to be looked at. The Lord wants us, upon our entry into eternity, to be completely in communion with our family in heaven. He doesn't want us to need uh, purgation. You know, he doesn't want us to have to be in a state of remorse and understanding. So this purgatory is actually 
evidence of God's mercy. I've heard people describe purgatory as terrible tortures, and that is possibly a misunderstanding of it, or maybe a partial understanding of it. My understanding of it is that this mist is there so that a person is isolated. It allowed for privacy for those souls who were examining their actions that hurt other people and their um, the way their spirits were disposed, which were you know disposed in pride or in, in ways inconsistent with the Lord's beautiful grace. I saw another, I looked towards another area and I saw a man and he was finished. You know, he was prepared to be in union with Christ, meaning go to heaven. And he was so timid, he was so humble that he just stayed there and other people were going. And um, he looked up and someone looked down at him like and said, come on, let's go, you're ready. <laughs> come. And he did. And it was just beautiful, really beautiful to see his joy that he was a saint. How beautiful. One thing I want to say about this, that uh, area of the light, like the park-like area, it's almost like people are then sharing and commiserating with each other. And as I moved through them, I could hear their conversations. And I was hearing things like, I understand, you know, I blocked out the Lord's grace, or someone saying, oh, I didn't want them to be enlightened. I rejected enlightenment. I would have had to change if I didn't receive the enlightenment. But they were recognizing with each other that they had been given by Christ opportunities in life to repent and to choose um, the correct path. So they were helping each other through this. And see, there's something about this community, uh, compassion and acceptance in the healing process, of course. When people think of purgatory, they should think of a place where there's perfect safety. There's no risk at all because the Lord has jurisdiction and the time for free will choice of good or bad is finished. Those people in purgatory have chosen God. They've chosen the family of God. So there's no risk. There's no hazard. It's part of the heavenly kingdom. And uh, some people would say, well, what if a soul is languishing because there's nobody to pray for them? But that's not the way it works in heaven. There's equity, you know, beautiful um, fairness. And so if somebody dies, maybe a pope dies. Everybody prays for this pope. But the pope, God's, God willing, would go straight to heaven. All those prayers would be used for other people in a system of justice that can only be divine. And this perfect justice is something you would like to study, a concept so beautiful, so beyond us here on earth, um, is applied there. I remember seeing the Lord drawing me far back into the mist where there were people suffering who had worked against God. And I understood at one area that these people had worked actively against God during their lives, knowingly, and at the last moment chose Christ, chose love, and chose all of us. Because when somebody rejects God, they reject every one of us because we are one family. And um, they were in a deep state of un understanding what all of their words and actions had done in the world, what the impact 
of their work against God had had on all this ripple effect. That would be very deep and painful work, and I could see that reflected in their self-immersion, very much closed into themselves and no uh, consoling companionship. And I saw one uh, almost like shrouded very deeply in this mist, and be, I, I could hear you know, him suffering, and he began to whimper. And then I saw Our Lady come walking through, and she has such um, <coughs> nobility. She walked through, I saw her coming through the mist with purpose and she knew just where she was going and she came and she put her hand on this person. She said, shh, God loves you, you are loved, shh, everything's all right, you are loved. And then the soul quieted down and I understood that he had received a terrific grace, understanding that this contact of love had enabled him then to move forward in his self-examination. And I think all of us on earth have had experiences where in a moment of distress or even near despair, um, we felt a grace of love. And somehow, some way, we just knew that we were loved and that we were not alone. And it's a calming thing. It's a soothing thing. And um, I think everybody's had some experience of that. And that would be what he had. Now, let's say I'm in purgatory. And let's say my mother is in heaven. My mother could come from heaven and see me in purgatory and be with me and pray for me there and near me. I wouldn't see her. I'm denied that, so you don't have that vision yet. You're not in heaven. You're not uh, in union. You know, there's self-acceptance, realization, responsibility that has to be taken first. Um, so they can come and visit and pray. You know, and if, uh, if somebody dies a family member dies, the soul in purgatory would be aware of the death of a family member or a loved one, and they'll pray very much for them, and they have very effective intercessory power. As I walked through the mist toward the light, I stopped at one woman who was praying very earnestly. I understood that she was suffering terrific remorse because she had had an abortion and lost a child that way, and I listened to her praying. And her prayers were so pure and so beautiful. And she had a complete understanding of her circumstances on earth, which prompted her to make the decision that she made. And that consoled her. And as I watched her and listened to her prayer, the mist got lighter and lighter, and, and she was suddenly kneeling in the sunshine, you know, in the light area. And I saw her stand up, and she had enormous dignity. And the way she stood up, like she knew she was home, she knew she belonged there, and she began to walk towards a group of people in that area, in the park area. And as she approached them, a man turned to her and smiled and welcomed. And it was like they'd known each other. He recognized her, she recognized him. Complete receiving, complete acceptance. It's very beautiful. People uh, can't understand the love that we're going to have in, in heaven. And purgatory is a, that area of purgatory is a foretaste of that.
I think the Lord wanted me to see the great difference between purgatory and hell. And for that reason and whatever other reasons he had, he showed me um, a little bit of hell. And I was able to see a being there who was um, dark and filled with hatred and a large kind of being. And all that he did was conspire in hatred against the church. And I just like there's an explosion of hatred and he reaches out and grabs another being and starts tormenting them and torturing them. It's just not for my eyes. I'm not interested, you know, this is the carry-on down there. And people reflect hell when they behave like this on earth. And I also understood that insofar as we have a spirit of obedience toward our faith and our church, we are also safe. We can't be t drawn into um, being used by the enemy to make war on God's children or on God's desires if we have a spirit of obedience to the magisterium. The spirit is the key word because people might be obedient in the prescription of the law, but their spirit is one of superiority and possibly pride. And they wouldn't resemble the saints in heaven if that was their disposition. Because I'm telling you in hell, there's all this pride and posturing. And um, when I looked upon what was going on there, uh, it's a situation where it's hatred. It's a, it's a gathering of hatred. Now, I was never afraid because we're not at risk. God is all powerful. I seldom talk about hell or Satan or anything. It doesn't excite me. It's just boring. It's like a distraction if you allow it and only if you allow it. People have this distorted idea that God has rejected them. That's the opposite of the truth. They have permanently rejected not only God, but each one of us very personally. And the family of God, that's who we are. They've rejected love. And hell is actually God's um, way of separating um, hatred so that we can all be safe in purgatory and in heaven. We are to be shielded from that. And I feel many ways in life we are shielded from that. You're shielded from that if you have a purity in your spirit. And if someone dies, no matter what they've done wrong, in my opinion, there's a second, a moment to, out of time, perhaps, where they're given the opportunity to look at Jesus Christ and make a decision. The Lord is there with mercy, and they have the option to receive the mercy, no matter what they've done. And they can receive it and come into the heavenly kingdom. So I'm telling you that I was happier in purgatory um, experiences than I, it's less confusing than here. It's quite lovely. It's part of heaven uh, in the sense that it's a place God has set aside for people to finish their purification process. It's nothing to be afraid of.